Okay, so here's the video I want to redo about the suffering for Christ. Uh, and, and this was actually spurred by a uh, uh, somebody new to the channel that we were talking about the methotrexate and everything. And they said they're going to go look for the last video. But I want to do this again because uh, I feel like we should do a refresher on this. I'm still having an emotional response from that last video. You call it what you want. I, judge it however you want to. I don't care. But the thing is, this is the last call. You know, the... There have been 2,000 years to get this right. 2,000 years to have faith. And I know V8's not good for you. I already heard all the things on it. Sometimes this is all I can get down food-wise to keep down. Um, and I'm overweight. <laughs> Go figure. Um, that's probably the most powerful video I've ever done. Um... I've done several of them that were very powerful. It's the last call for salvation. If you can't figure it out now, you've got, yes, please come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's amen, Edward. If you can't figure it out at this point, it's you're either not going to get it or it'll take the tribulation to snap you out of it. These people, it's just, it's, it's so, it's sad, but it's infuriating at the same time. It's like, how can you look at this? How can you read the same Bible I'm reading and get something so completely different? But it's because of what's in their heart. So we do what we can. Uh, we share the truth as much as we can. Don't be afraid to get up in somebody's grill. Tell them the truth. Be honest with them. Ooh, that's good. That's tasty. Taste than I thought it would be. Okay. Let's get back on track. Um, so I want to talk about suffering for Christ. And that means a lot of different things. A lot of people say, oh, I need to suffer for Christ. I need to be beheaded for Christ. No. No, you don't. Uh, I need to be crucified. No. No, you don't. There's some people that are like, I, I want to be crucified. Why? Why do you want to be crucified? So I can suffer like Christ did. We suffer like Christ every day. Hold on, that might be my wife. No, it's not. Um, we suffer for Christ every day. Facing the persecution of suffering for Christ. Being called names, mocked and scoffed and made fun of, that's suffering for Christ. What those guys are doing to us on, these, on their videos they're making of us, that's suffering for Christ. But there's another suffering that we don't quite get, that we don't really catch on to. And I shared this once. Oh, excuse me. I shared this once, and a few people got it, and they were like, oh, wow, I never realized that before, but I figure I want to do it again. Because if you're, if you're going through pain and suffering, you may be suffering for Christ right now in that pain and suffering. And I want to show you something that's that's very interesting. And I showed much of this in the other video, and we're going to elaborate on that a little bit more. So we're in 1 Peter 4.1. Remember the last video, we were in 1 Peter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, think about what he's saying, in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who suffered, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That's interesting. That's interesting. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. Back then the Gentiles were unbelievers. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, rivalries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in this same flood of dissipation. Dissipation. Speaking evil of you. See, you're supposed to be like everybody else. But when you're not, when you're trying to align with Scripture and align with God and draw closer to Him, they don't like you. I was made fun of in my own church. Some of you guys have that testimony. They will give an account to Him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to the flesh, the men of according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Think about what that's saying. First Peter 4 is a great study. For this reason, 
The gospel was preached also to those who were dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But in the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. They were saying this 2,000 years ago. How much more should we be like this now? If you haven't watched the video I just uploaded, go watch it. And then come back to this one. There's no games to be played here. These people are playing high school games. There's no games to be played here. This is serious. This is eternity and there's no time left to make this decision you have right now to make this decision i cannot i cannot stress how close we are to all this ending and if you miss this you will suffer needlessly i can't say it any way other than the way i'm saying it because there are people that are watching this video right now if they haven't clicked away because they get offended so easy, that are going to be here for the tribulation. Don't do that. There are even some, I dare say, that are watching this video right now who will die in the beginning and stand in hell until the resurrection of the dead at the white throne judgment. I'm sorry for you. But I can't change you. Verse 8, And above all things have fervent love for one another for love will cover a multitude of sins be hospitable to one another without grumbling as each one has received a gift minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of god if anyone speaks let him speak as the oracles of god if anyone ministers let him do it with the ability which god supplies that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. So every ministry is a little different. Everybody has a different ministry to work in, and God supplies to them what they need in order to perform that ministry. Yet we got people out here that are judging, oh, if you don't have this kind of ministry, you're not going to heaven. Wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. Now, suffering as a Christian. 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Remember what we said in the very first verse? Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Let's go back down here. Verse 13, But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Is he just talking about the mocking and the scoffing? Nope. He's talking about the suffering and pain too. Now, what I'm going to tell you here in a few minutes is going to be my opinion, but it's an opinion that I derived from reading scripture. Let's go through a little bit more. 1 Peter 4.14 If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. He says, don't suffer in those things. Because there's people that are like, well, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to hate on all these people. And because they, and they'll do, they put this on YouTube too. They'll say, oh, look, look what they're doing. I, I said all that stuff, but now look at how they're coming back to me and responding to me. They're hating on me. And it's a glory. It's a blessing to me. No, that's not what that's saying. You don't get the blessing because you did something nasty first and they're responding to it. You don't get any blessing. You're not glorifying God. You're cursing him. That's why 1 Peter 4.15 says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a hater. Hate is murder, remember? A thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet that's what those people are doing. But then they get upset. Oh, look, they're, they're, they're mocking and scoffing me. I, I got a blessing coming. No, you don't. No, you don't. Not according to Scripture. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, how does a Christian suffer? Mocking, scoffing. Just for you telling the truth. Mocking, scoffing, railing, condemning, cursing. Go, go watch. If you can dare to hear it, go watch News Unit's videos he's done about me. All that stuff is present. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. I glorify God for these things, and I'm thankful that my my name is written in heaven, but I, I worry for those people's soul too. 
Verse 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, us being saved, us being the saint, if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Very powerful in what's hidden within that statement. Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Where do you think? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Now, I want to go back and I want to highlight to you. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened. But rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. There's other scriptures that talk about the different kinds of suffering that Christians go through. I want to go and take a look at a few of them. So here's 1 Peter 3.14. Let's go take a look at that. Suffering for righteousness' sake. So verse 14 is down here. We're going to read it in context. 1 Peter 3, 8, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips from speaking deceit. That's why when I'm over there on some of the other channels, I don't curse those people. They've got enough on their head right now. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. I don't go to their channels looking for trouble. I go to their channels to respond every now and then, reaching out. Maybe I can get to one of them. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? No one. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, when they call you names, when they mock you, scoff you, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now all this that I'm talking about, this includes physical suffering too. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who firmly were disobedient. But once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of filth from the f flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice what it says here. They'll tell you baptism, you have to have baptism. Water baptism. Yet 1 Peter 3.21 says, no. Read it and study it. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Now we're going to get there to what I'm originally going to talk about here. There's First Peter four one. Now, uh, see, you suffer the whole story, make you strong. Second Timothy three twelve. Let's go to that one. So in Second Timothy three twelve, all Scripture is breathed out by God. It says here, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So we were going to continue in what we're doing. We're going to suffer. If we want to be godly, we're going to suffer. You will suffer. Now, some people seem to think that them having to be corrected with Scripture is them being mocked and scoffed. I can go and just share Scripture in one of those people's comment sections and they'll say, Look, look how he's attacking me. Look how he's attacking me with Scripture. I'm not attacking you. I'm showing you the Scripture that says you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. It's not me. That's the Bible attacking you. They don't like that. They don't realize the type of suffering a Christian, a true Christian goes through. Um, Colossians 1.24. Now we're going to get into the meat and potatoes. Colossians 
Paul's ministry to the church. Colossians 1.24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up my flesh, fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Another confirmation that the church is the body, the church is the bride, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which is given to me to, for you to fulfill the words of God. What sufferings in his flesh is he talking about? Physical sufferings? Yeah, you know Paul suffered a lot physically. He was beaten. He had the stripes and everything like Christ had. I want to show you something here. It's very interesting. Back then, that was the common thing that went on. But I want to show you how Christ can actually make you suffer the same way in just in physical pain that you go through. And we wonder why we have these things. There's a reason why we have these things. We're going to get there. Stay with me. Uh, let's see. Let's see, Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 3, we're going to start in verse 1, Isaiah 53, 1, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, not as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Let's talk about Jesus. He is despised and rejected by men. This is verse 3 in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 isn't read to Jews. You know they took this out of the Torah? They took, verse, they took chapter 53 out. Because most Jews, especially younger Jews, when they hear Isaiah 53, most of them convert. They, they so desperately don't want people to believe in Jesus that they took out part of their own scripture. They corrupted their own book, denying Christ. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. That's an interesting statement because he's talking like it's in first person. Isaiah wasn't there. Who was there? The apostles. The apostles did that. They hid their face. Peter denied him three times. The rooster crowed. Surely he was born our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. He was a lamb as if it was butchered, as it was offered up to sacrifice. Is it any wonder we would suffer the same way? Watch, we're going to get there. Let's see. There's a crown of life, according to James 1-2, that we're going to get for that kind of stuff, having stood the test. see Romans 5 3 let's go there we're going to start in Romans 5 1 read a few verses Romans 5 1 says therefore having been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. We, get our, we are strengthened, and we are sanctified through this even, um, and ultimately glorified through this. It's a process that we go through. Romans 8.18 Future glory. Romans 8.18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. 
So even the creation is waiting for all this to happen. They're suffering too. Let's see. There's one more particular one I'm looking for. First Peter two nineteen through twenty one. That's another good one. So here's verse 19, for it is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if you are beaten with, for your faults? You take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. We're supposed to suffer. A lot of people are, are, will make you think, oh no, you shouldn't be suffering. No, we're, we're called to this. There's a reason why we're called to this. Because this translates into sal uh, glory, translates into reward, it translates into blessing on the other side. This Every bit of this has a purpose of what we go through. Verse 22, Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, have di having died to sins, might live for righteousness, whose, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the sheep herd and overseer of your souls. Uh... 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10. Treasure in jars of clay. We're going to start in verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's our flesh. That the excellence of the power of God may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. We're suffering in the flesh here. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Now people will tell you, when you get baptized with water, you're dying in Christ and you're rising in Christ. The rising in Christ hasn't happened yet. It's the day of redemption. We are continually dying daily in this dead flesh, in Christ. For that day of resurrection, to be resurrected. When Christ appears, we also shall appear. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So you see over and over again, we're seeing how he's talking about our flesh is being persecuted, our flesh is being destroyed, our flesh is being, being tortured. It's supposed to be. Sin is in that flesh. Sin is trying to rip that flesh apart. But we have something greater because the spirit within us is going to be delivered. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Pretty interesting. Let's see. I think that's the end of it. James 1, Romans 5. Uh, Matthew 5, 10 through 12, and then we're going to talk about something. I want to show you something that I had come up with and did a video on. Now, if you can stumble across another video, it's a ways back um, about our sufferings. Um, there was some other stuff I shared, and they're different from this one. Uh, the Beatitudes are in Matthew 5. Matthew 5 is a great, great verse. Um, lust, divorce, oaths. I forgot which one it was. It's 10 through 12. Okay. Matthew 5 is a great chapter. Okay, so right after the Beatitudes, Matthew 5.10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's physical and mental and persecution. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. 
Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So persecutions are a normal thing that we're going to endure. I wish I could find that one. Let me see if I can dig it up here real quick because I wanted to share this one too. Second Corinthians twelve seven. Corinthians twelve seven. So here's and lest I should be exalted. Now listen very closely to what he says. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. So he was getting all these revelations about stuff. I can relate to that. Many of you guys can. A thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. It's to humble you. Now, this is why so much of us suffer. He suffered in the flesh. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches, in needs and persecutions and distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak... Then I am strong. We stay humble by going through the things that we're going through. Now Paul talks about this quite a bit, uh, about the, f the suffering in the flesh that he went through. He was bitten by a viper. It came out whenever that ship had a shipwreck. They were building a fire. And the fire was lit. So this snake was, was Satan messing with him. He stuck his hand under and put wood in the fire. Snake come flying out. Bit him on a hand. He shook it off and kept on going. And they were watching. All the guys were watching. They were like, whoa, Really? Well, this is definitely a man of God. Look what just happened to him. Paul suffered a lot in the flesh. All the apostles suffered in the flesh. They were beaten. They were in prison. All kinds of stuff happened to them. I believe Paul actually has probably suffered more than the other guys did. But if Christ suffered in the flesh, they suffered in the flesh, the prophets suffered in the flesh, all the great men of God suffered in the flesh, who are we to think that we're not going to suffer in the flesh? Now, a lot of people will take that argument and say, see, we have to go through the tribulation. No. That's a different kind of suffering. That suffering is for the ungodly in Israel. That's not for those who are born again. Now, I want you to think about something. If we're going to suffer in the flesh, and Paul talks about it right here, how he was he suffered in the flesh. Let's see. Right here. Right there. He talked about that suffering in the flesh. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Now, I want you to think about something for a minute. Think about Christ on, on the cross. Now, the other video, I shared a whole lot of other stuff that goes with this. Think about Christ on the cross. Think about the suffering he went through. First, he was beaten all across his back, ripped his back apart, to the point that his spine was showing, literally through his flesh. He was bleeding to death. Beaten all about, crown of thorns. Had all them pokes in there. All them thorns shoved down inside his skin. And you know thorns have that little coating on them. That stings really bad. Then they put him up on the cross. They can't put the nail here because there's no, there's no bone in here just for the fingers. It'll just rip out. They put it here because this is where all the tendons are. You can hang, from, you can hang all your body weight from that if you put a nail through there. Well, also there's a nerve, a main nerve that runs right up through there and curves around. When you put that nail through there, it activates that nerve. It shoots pain all the way through into your chest. He had one on both wrists. Now think about where they did his feet, because they took the feet and laid them overlapping. Because if you push down on your foot, and in that video I show you on my foot, there's a gap. You can you push down, you find the bone going up the foot, and then when you hit the ankle, there's a gap. Now, all that stuff was expensive material, so those nails, they, they, they wanted to get back. So they would find that gap and hold it at a certain angle and tap it through, because it would pass through the gap all the way through out by the heel bone. It went straight in between the bones. Well, there's a nerve that runs down your leg that goes right through there, and it goes through your sciatic nerve in the bottom of your foot. But they would run it through that because that's where the meat was. They didn't have to pound it through the bone. Because if they put it through the bone, they weren't getting it back. In fact, uh, they have a relic over there of a, of a foot bone of a man who was crucified, and the nail actually had gone through his foot bone. They couldn't get it back, so they left it there. And they, they found it, and it was in a tomb. He, he had been buried. So these guys, no, it wasn't Jesus' foot. I already know what people are going to say. 
So they, they knew that about the anatomy, that they could put it through that little gap in between the bones. And it would pass in between them, just like here, same thing. A bunch of little bones right there would pass through the bones. So they could pull the nails back out and get them. How do you think they got them off the cross? They had to pull the nails out and get those nails back. And they would reuse them. That stuff was expensive. I mean, you imagine their mining process for metal <laughs> and the smelting process is nothing like it is today. Now, everything was done by hand. It took a long time. So if you had stuff made out of iron like that, that was expensive. Swords were expensive. All that stuff was expensive. So a lot of swords were made out of bronze because it was easier to get and manipulate. And they were worthless, pretty much worthless. So that's where his pain was. Now think about when he's hanging on there. He's hanging like this. All his body weight is supported by his wrists which is excruciating pain going down both arms into his chest because of the nerves. But it's also through his feet, so it's through his sciatic nerve, which is going up the back of his leg into his gluteus area and into his lower back. And he can't support himself there. He either has to hang down or he has to push up on his feet and hold himself up. Either way, it's excruciating pain throughout his entire body. His lower back would start to bow out because it would get weak. So now he's hanging like this, bowed out. It was excruciating. There was no comfortable place to go. It was designed as a type of torture like that. They put you in that position for a reason. So you would suffer till you died. You suffered hours. So now he's hanging there. When he finally gets so tired, he can't hold himself up because his back's given out. He's hanging like this. Well, all that body weight's pulling up on him like this. He just he can't he has no strength left. So he, all his body weight's pulling down. All his lower body's compressed. So that's pulling on his feet on that nail, which got a big head on it so it can't come off. Now he can't breathe. So he's struggling to breathe. He's got pain. Just me holding my arms like this hurts. He's got pain, both wrists, down both arms, into both sides of his chest. He's got pain in both his feet, going up his legs through his sciatic, into his glute area. His lower back is giving out. His knees are giving out. His thighs are giving out. Everything burns and hurts. Plus he's got all those tear marks in this flesh. It's rubbing up against that tree. That hurts, bare spine rubbing up against it, and he's bleeding to death. And he's got a crown of thorns on his head. Do you have carpal tunnel syndrome? I do. If you got anything involving rheumatoid, all the sacs that go around your tendons swell up right here, in this part of your wrist. I've got it in both wrists. My lower back, I have a hernia in my lower back, and my lower back wears out super fast, super easy. Just standing up doing dishes and cleaning the house, uh, it, it wears out and I have to lay down and stretch it out. Jesus had that pain too. His knees were killing him. I have a hard time walking up and down stairs. This foot, which was probably the first foot, whoops, which was probably the first foot that had the spike go through it, my, my right foot, I tore a bunch of tendons right there where that gap is, and it pops constantly. All the time, every time I walk and step, it pops. And that foot is weak and that foot has pain. All the time. The other foot does too, but this one does it the most. That probably would have been the first foot the spike went through. Exact same place where the spike went through on him. I have breathing issues. How many of you are starting to be like, whoa, wait a minute. I've got a lot of that stuff. Migraines. Skin conditions on your back. Painful. And it's all the time. And it never goes away. I'm just saying, guys, read the scriptures. Think about it. If you're gonna if you're suffering as a Christian with these types of pains, and people are looking at you going, Why are you suffering so much? You shouldn't be sick like that. You must have done something wrong. No. Actually, you did something right. That's why you're suffering with that. If you were suffering the same pain Christ suffered, it don't have to be a, a spike going through, but you can still have the pain there. Think about it. You got arthritis in your hands? You know with that spike there pushing on that nerve? It was also cutting off the blood supply because it was squeezing the arteries. So both his hands were going to sleep. What happens? They curl up. They curl up and they stay like that. Think about it. You know what he, with him hanging like that, you know what he had to do? And you've seen it in the pictures and on the, on the crosses and everything. And he's got a crick in his neck. 
Can't find any place comfortable. Everything hurts. Everything's pulling. Imagine you've got all your body weight pulling on that. Lay your head over. My neck pops all the time back here. Hurts all the time. The muscles lock up all the time. Same injuries. The pain in the same places Christ had his pain. And that's not for glory. That's, that's not for pride. But if we're, if we're going to suffer in the flesh, just like Paul said, just like the other apostles said, if we're suffering in the flesh, Christ's sufferings, that's not just mocking, scoffing, name-calling, and all that stuff. It's also the physical pain. And if you're suffering through that physical pain, what does that tell you? You don't get that for doing the wrong thing. That's a blessing to have that. That's why he tells you, I, I rejoice in these pains because I know Christ is paying attention to me. He's looking at me. He deems me worthy to suffer to him. you got people that are living a perfect life, their best life now. Well, I'm going to go get my head cut off in the tribulation. That's going to justify me. No, it's not. You know how many people get their head cut off every day in this world? And they're not saved, and it does not send them to heaven. You're getting your head cut off doesn't save you. It doesn't justify you. But they don't have any pain. They're rich. they got all kinds of money. They're blood. They're, everything's going good. But they'll sure condemn somebody who's got health issues. You must have done something wrong. I've had that happen at my church. One of the elders told me that. You must have done something wrong. Maybe you shouldn't be an elder of this church because you're not reading your Bible. The apostles, chosen specifically by Christ himself, in the flesh, right in front of them, they suffered these same pains Christ suffered. They went through these same issues and these same things Christ suffered. Was it Paul or John that was a net maker or a tent maker? Hanging out in Patmos there for a while. I forget which one it was. You ever done that kind of work? Sewing by hand? Tears up your fingers? Tears up? Yeah, same pain. So if you you have those pains, think about that. Now, obviously, don't. This is my opinion, but I'm I'm trying to base it in scripture if I can. I'm not trying to to justify it or prove it, but think about that. Doesn't that make sense? That if we're suffering those things, that then it makes sense. We see all these Christians that have nothing wrong in their life. Everything's perfect for them. Yet we see scripture that says if you desire to live a godly life in, in 1 Peter, you will suffer persecutions. You will suffer for Christ. You will suffer tribulation. Mental and physical. And here we are. That means you have glory waiting for you. You will have an abundant entry into heaven. Because all this is happening to translate into glory. To translate into a blessing. I find it amazing that he's... Even all this pain that I'm in, now that I... Like this wrist is really hurting now. All this pain that I'm in, all this suffering that I'm going through, and these struggles, that I find it uh, enlightening and I find it exhilarating because I, now I know what it's, what it's for and what it's coming from. It's not that I did anything wrong. It's that I'm doing things right. And he's actually blessing me because of that. Now, to some people, it may not make sense. I don't understand how being in physical pain makes sense. Pain and suffering here, I just read you the scriptures, translates into a blessing over there. So when you get there, you're going to realize, hey, wow, those scriptures were true. So think about that and go into prayer about that. Ask God, don't believe me, ask God for the answers. But that's what I was taught and what I was shown, not by man, by the Holy Spirit. And this was like at the end of last year that, that I, was, I had come to this realization and realized that's what all this suffering is for because I've got pain in the exact same place as Christ would have had pain. And if you've got that too, you're suffering for him. The same way he suffered while he was hanging on that cross, that's glory. That's a blessing. It's a huge blessing. And it's an honor to be found worthy to suffer that way. In our flesh and in this world, and the way the world wants us to believe, we think that's a negative, but it actually is a, it's an honor to be considered worthy enough to suffer like that. To suffer like Christ suffered. So there are all these people that say, oh yeah, I want to be crucified. That way I can suffer like Christ did. Why don't you just walk right with God and go and do according to the Bible? And you'll have it.
Think about it. Contemplate it. Go over There's more scripture on this. Do your own studies on this. But think about that for a minute. And what that'll do is that's going to make you more aware of what you're going through and where you're, you are in your walk with him. Because if he's drawn, he's very, God is very drawn, very close to the brokenhearted and those who are in pain. Those who are suffering. Very close to the broken in spirit. He has a very high appreciation for that. Here, it means one thing to us, but over there it means something totally different and better. So consider that. Think about that. If you're struggling through those kinds of pains, think about where Christ had his pain. And now you have pain there. They don't even know why I have what I have. They still can't identify what caused it. It's not rheumatoid arthritis. It's not lupus. It doesn't come up on any scale, yet I have all these symptoms. Why? No, I, You guys would be amazed how many doctors I've seen, and they can't explain it. I have horrible breathing issues. Yet they go in there and they're like, we can't find anything wrong. That's a conundrum. And it don't happen very often. Yet here it is. I went from able being able to run two miles in 15 minutes in my PT test, working out twice a day, two hours at least, lifting weights. I was out lifting everybody perfect physical condition in 10 months couldn't walk up a flight of stairs literally it would take it was everything I could do to make it up a flight of stairs because I was in so much pain guess where? all the places Christ had pain at that time it didn't dawn on me what was going on people would look at me and be like weren't you just didn't I just see you at the gym here? yeah What's, what happened? don't know nobody knows they can't figure it out why is that? why is that? He deemed me worthy to suffer the way he suffered. And now that I understand what it is, I glory in it and I revel in it. I'm glad to have it. Does it suck when I'm trying to do stuff? Yeah, you betcha. But the thing is, I know that, that what this is meant to achieve. And so I push through, do what I got to do. And when I need to rest, I rest. When I'm tired, I sit down. Sabbath rest. By this I know he's pleased with me. Otherwise he wouldn't have found me worthy to suffer the way he suffered. Because that is an honor to suffer like Christ suffered. You don't have to be staked up on a cross to suffer like Christ. You can have a YouTube ministry where you're preaching the truth and suffer just like Christ did. So all this stuff that these people are doing, it doesn't offend me. Uh, it's a, To me it's a blessing. It, it's To me, and the way from reading scriptures, the way I now understand it, they are pouring out a blessing upon me. And this was ordained by Christ. And he's pleased with what I'm doing. I got people telling me, you're not hearing the, the audible voice of Christ, you're not saved. I beg to differ. I think I am hearing his voice audibly, but I'm hearing it with my spiritual ears, not my physical ears. But I see the manifestation of it all around me. And the pain I suffer, and the mocking and scoffing, these people are fulfilling prophecy and scripture involving us in the end times perfectly and they don't even realize it but I see Christ manifesting right before my eyes and Satan don't like it because he tries to convince me otherwise and I fight him at tooth and nail every day so consider this, guys, and do your own research on this. Look at the other scriptures I'm talking about the different sufferings that they were going through and how they related it to Christ's sufferings because it's written everywhere in the New Testament. It's a blessing to suffer in this way. It's a real honor to be considered worthy to suffer like Christ because not everybody does. They think it's a bad thing. They shun it. I Bring me more. I'll suffer more pain. It's okay. I'll go and I'll take a hit from News Unit if he wants to punch me in the mouth like he said. Come on, throw me a beating. I'm not going to hit, hit you back because what did they do to Christ? And when he was hung up on that cross what, where everybody thought they were going to see shame, actually he was in glory. Remember what the centurion said? This truly, he dropped to his knee and said, this truly is the Son of God.
Remember the thief on the cross? Told the other thief, you need to shut up. We deserve what we get. This man did nothing. He is the son of God. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You can't imagine what they probably did to that centurion when he admitted that. He was probably beaten and put in jail for heresy and for crimes against the state of Rome. For, for making that admission in front of everybody. Suffered like Christ. Think about it. Contemplate it. And if you're going through these things, if you have these pains, that's an honor. Count it an honor and a blessing that's being poured out on you to suffer like this. Because when we get on the other side, it translates into something far greater. I love you guys very much. I hope these videos are a blessing to you guys. Y'all are testifying in the comment sections how, how much of a blessing these videos are to you. And uh, that makes me feel good that people are getting something positive out of them. That you guys are looking past my faults and my shortcomings and seeing the word that's being delivered through the Holy Spirit that's working through me. I, I want no glory on this. It all goes to Him. He's coming. Nay, I say He is here. And there's no time left. If you haven't figured it out by now, you have one last chance because the last call for salvation is going out and that door is going to be shut. And when it's closed, when we get on the ark and that door is shut, you will not be able to get in. When you see it all happen and you you find yourself still standing here, you can't drop to your knees and say, Lord, save me. It's too late. You will be here for those seals. The Bible says so. The great multitude doesn't go to heaven until after the seals after the sixth seal. Don't do that. Get on the ark now. Repent. Turn to him. Change your mind. Change your path. Go from the life of unbelief to the life of belief. And if you're, you think you're already there, examine yourself. Go to the word. Look what it says. Don't be so proud to think that you've got it figured out. I don't have it figured out. I, che I check myself and test myself daily. Go and examine yourself, just like the Bible says, to see whether you're in the faith. Just like the Bible says. And if you are, praise God, and we will stand in heaven together. If you're not, the Bible says what's going to happen. Pretty clear. See you guys in the next video.